Harvard Divinity School. Explorations in Interdisciplinary Psychedelic Research. University Speakers Group 2, April 1st, 2023. So I now have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our second round of university speakers. As Paul and I mentioned in the introduction, an element of both of our research is looking into the hidden religious origins of the modern clinical psychedelic paradigm. There is truly no part of psychedelic studies that isn't in some way informed by cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is the heart of today's conference. This will be made abundantly clear with the next round of speakers who represent some of the incredible work that is happening in the clinical, therapeutic, and interdisciplinary spaces at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Teaching Hospitals. As before, I will again introduce each speaker with a snippet from their biography. The full biographies of all of our amazing speakers can be found in the program, the virtual program, at that QR code. And for those on the live stream, it should be pasted in the, uh, the chat. Again, same as in the morning, we will have a Q&A with all of the speakers from this university block at the end. So please save your questions for individual speakers for that time. With all that said, I'm now very excited to welcome to the stage Dr. Franklin King. Dr. Franklin King is the Director of Training and Education at Mass General Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics and a clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School. In addition to sharing his work, Dr. King has also generously offered to speak about the work at Mass Gen broadly, as his colleague Charmaine Ghaznavi was unable to attend for family reasons. Thank you so much, Franklin. Welcome to the stage. Hey, all right. Just have my phone timer on to make sure that I don't go over. But yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. So this is amazing. Um, this is an area that I've been interested in for so long. And this goes back into medical school, um, a lot of failed starts in residency, trying to get involved in research, trying to get research started. Raised eyebrows, people looking askance that this is a valid interest in psychiatry. And it's just incredible. I mean, the sea change over the last few years is unbelievable. And I think the roster of speakers that you're seeing today is a testament to that. You know, we're really lucky in Boston, uh, in the Harvard community, to have so many different areas and niches. And what's really cool about psychedelics, you're getting a little editorial here before I tell you about what I actually do. But what's really cool about psychedelics is that they have applicability to almost any area of academic study. And that's why we're seeing all these amazing speakers from the GSD, from the Divinity School, the Law School, the Business School, and medicine. So, you know, I think it's important to frame the discussion about psychedelics, particularly medicalized psychedelics by sort of drawing the focus away a little bit from the exoticism and the titillation that people feel about psychedelics. You know, these are things that are sort of symbolic of rebellion and they're disruptive and other than ketamine, they're still all completely illegal if you're not working with them in a research setting. And I think that's not really the, the thing that we should be thinking about with psychedelics, particularly if we're using them as tools for healing. What I find most interesting about psychedelics is that they really cut through a lot of conventional paradigms in medicine. And I think that's really important in this day and age. Right now, we are in the middle in psychiatry and in medicine generally in the midst of a crisis, right? We're seeing suicides increasing year over year. It's one of the most common cause of young people. We are seeing rapidly rising rates of depression, anxiety. PTSD, overdose deaths, particularly since the pandemic, have been skyrocketing. The so-called deaths of despair that you read about in the New York Times. And then generally in medicine in this country, the wealthiest place in the world, we're seeing a sharp decline in life expectancy. And so I don't say all this to trash medicine. I'm a practicing physician. Most of my work is actually clinical. Um, but really, despite the fact that we have so many amazing medical advances, you know, when you work at a place like MGH, I mean, it's incredible. People are getting treated for cancers and conditions that you can't get anywhere else in the world or even in the United States. So, you know, I'm a big believer in the wonders of modern medicine, but there are vast swaths of people and patients that are not being touched. And in a lot of ways, we're actually going in the wrong direction. And so I think it's important to just be open and admit the fact that this is what's happening. This is kind of the landscape in psychiatry. And this, I think, is why people are so willing to consider giving these agents that until recently were demonized, right? These are the last things that anybody should be taking, let alone our most vulnerable patients 
people with depression and PTSD. And it's really the background of this crisis that is leading us all, I think, to be more open to looking at these. And because psychedelics cut through this whole conventional medical paradigm, right? So normal medical paradigm, no offense, when you go see your doctor, your doctor's just trying to have a nice interpersonal relationship, manipulate information out of you that can be written down in data. They're gonna get some blood work, they're gonna get imaging, they're gonna process the data, give you a diagnosis, which is a label, and write you a prescription. And this works for a lot of things, right? This is not how psychedelics work. Psychedelics can't work that way. They never are going to work that way. And so I think this is one of the major challenges that we're gonna be looking at as we medicalize psychedelics, that they are so different from the way that clinicians are trained, particularly physicians. All right, so I think this is both a challenge in terms of how to educate people, but it's also a great potential benefit because it just transcends and gets right outside this whole medical paradigm that just isn't working for so many people. So that's kind of my spiel on why I'm interested in these things. I wanna tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the CNP. I wanna acknowledge uh, Jerry Rosenbaum who ran our Mass General Department of Psychiatry for many years. He's a friend, he's a mentor, and he's now the director of our center. Um, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Sharman Ghaznavi, uh, who is the associate director of the center and doing a lot of really amazing research. Um, you know, without them, the center wouldn't be here, and both of them really wish that they could be here today. Um, unfortunately, they could not, so you're stuck with me. Um, <laughs> What is the Center? So the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics, you can look it up, um, but really it is a center that essentially is, is more of sort of a collaborative, I like to think of it. It's a number of different researchers and clinicians. We're truly interdisciplinary. I mean, we have people doing bench research, we have people that are doing primarily neuroimaging, not with patients, um, ranging up to people in psychiatry. We have a cardiologist uh, who's uh, a member of our center. We have a study in gastroenterology that I'll tell you about. And really we're sort of united in a shared vision of researching psychedelics um, to enhance neuroscientific understanding of mental disorders and also to advance progress in healing all of these treatment resistant conditions, the folks that come to MGH who've tried everything and nothing has worked. So, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the studies. Um, just to sort of say, there's a lot of studies that I can't talk about or that would just be kind of bad form to talk about because they're so early on in planning um, that we have a lot of hope in terms of funding and regulatory processes that I think in the, another couple of years, we're gonna have many more things that we can actually speak of publicly that are definitely happening, IRB approved, et cetera. Um, I also don't wanna to speak too much in terms of other people's uh, research, but I'll mention that I think you know, the flagship study of the center is the one being run by Sharman Ghaznavi right now. Um, this is a study that is currently enrolling. This is really the study that kind of got everything going. It's a psilocybin assisted therapy study enrolling people with treatment resistant depression with a neuroimaging component while people are actually in the middle of their psilocybin session. So this is a really bold study and I think it's gonna yield some truly amazing information about sort of how psilocybin works, not just in the brains, of healthy normal people, which is basically all the research that we have at this point, but actually figuring out what's going on in the depressed brain of patients um, under the influence of psilocybin. You can look up if you're interested in more about this study. Um, you can look up on YouTube. Dr. Ghaznavi's given some talks and also uh, check out the center website if you know people that might want to enroll in this. Um, and there's a number of other studies that Dr. Ghaznavi is also working on that are sort of in various stages of the pipeline. Um, in terms of what I do from a research standpoint, so this is a really exciting week for me. Um, I am working, I'm the principal investigator of this study. I'm working with a friend and colleague, Dr. Erin Monty, who's actually a pediatric gastroenterology fellow. It's really her study, but she's still a fellow, so she needs an attending to be the PI, that's me. And we're gonna be doing two courses of psilocybin-assisted therapy for patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So this week, we just, trained up our team of study therapists. Uh, we're probably still a year away from actually enrolling people in this study, but it really, it's just, you know, when, once you bring the team together and you have the people that are gonna be doing the work, it's sort of like this huge step, um, really feeling pretty good about uh, the folks that we have working on this. Another inter interdisciplinary study, obviously uh, IBS, and there's gonna be an imaging component and also some cardiac research, looking at heart rate variability and some other cardiac parameters with this. Um, I'm also the study psychiatrist on another pilot 
that's going to be using MDMA-assisted therapy for the treatment of fibromyalgia. I didn't mention at the beginning, but I did a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine, which is now called CL psychiatry, but it's basically psychiatry, the interface of medical disorders and psychiatric disorders. And that's really kind of the area of interest I have for, uh, for psychedelic work. Um, this study is being led by Vitaly Napadao. That's the PI. He is a professor and a pain neuroimaging researcher at Mass General and at Spalding Rehab. And for this study, we're going to be doing two rounds of MDMA-assisted therapy and conducting hyperscan. And what that means is that we are going to, during the MDMA session, we're going to be doing simultaneous uh, neuroimaging of the participant and one of the two study therapists. And part of the, the goal of this is to look at the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the participant um, while they're actually on MDMA. For those that know a little bit about MDMA, we expect that there's going to be an enhancement of the therapeutic relationship, and we might be able to see, um, see some of that on, in, in data form. All right, so, so stay tuned about that. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more of some of the other work that we're doing at the center from uh, Dr. Stephen Haggerty in a few minutes. And lastly, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is, 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 is educating clinicians. As I mentioned earlier, I think this is just, there's so much in this work that is anathema or has become, unfortunately, anathema to kind of the, the modern way of practicing medicine. And if this is really going to be something that can enter into medical practice without a lot of harm and people getting bad treatment, people that never should have been referred in the first place, or unrealistic expectations, another huge issue in psychedelics, we really need to start educating doctors and therapists and psychiatrists who really largely um, don't know anything about this. I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of physicians in the audience. I'm sure you've been interested in psychedelics for a very long time. Most people in this space tend to already be interested in it. You're not the folks that we need to reach. We need to really get this uh, cast a much broader net. So I work with the Mass General Psychiatry uh, Academy. The academy has a huge reach across the world and does a lot of conferences and educational missions. And in 2021, we started what's now become an annual conference. We did one day in 2021. We did two days this year um, for various reasons. I think we're going to push the next one into spring 2024, but hopefully uh, expanding it. We had speakers come from around the world, um, had almost 500 attendees, mostly psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, psychotherapists, and the like. Really just kind of teach them about the landscape and, and how the therapy works. Um, and I think you know th this is a really critical time, right? I mean, it's expected that we're going to have MDMA assisted therapy probably approved in 2024. So it's like a year away from actually being a real thing. And we really got to start getting people educated in this. So that's one, one thing that I'm involved in. And lastly, uh, an area that's really exciting to me is educating junior faculty and junior clinicians. You know, these are the folks that are in residency right now who by the time they graduate are actually going to be able to be doing legally psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, these are the folks that really we need to get trained in this. And I've been working with MAPS which is the organization that has been studying MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD, um, with a couple of my colleagues at Brigham and Women's, and Beth Israel, Dr. Michael Alpert, Dr. Roxy Sholivar. And we are going to, in October, do a five-day residential educational retreat for all Harvard psychiatry residents who want to participate, probably also some junior faculty social workers and psychologists who are HMS-affiliated. Um, and get them trained up and educated in MDMA-assisted therapy with a series of seminar series and other didactic sessions that we're going to put together to address some of the other psychedelics. So this is, uh, we actually haven't sent the emails out. We're hoping to do that next week, but it's called the Harvard Interdisciplinary Program in Psychedelics. It's the first time it's been publicly announced right here, so super exciting. Um, and hopefully that will also, thanks, yeah. And you know, we hope to make that an annual thing as well as part of our, the residency training program across the Harvard network. So I'm going to stop there. I think maybe a little bit of extra time, maybe 1226. Um, and I'll give it over to Jeff, but thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. King. I will say that that is probably the first time I've heard a contented, happy murmur through a crowd at the mention of irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. So, 
something to be proud of. Um, <laughs> next up, I'm welcoming to the stage Dr. Yvonne Boussant, who is a hematologist and palliative care physician investigator trained in psychedelic assisted therapies and serving as instructor of medicine at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Boussant. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I will echo many things that Dr. King said, uh, starting to say how excited I am to be here and to see all of you here. Thank you uh, to Jeff and Paul and all those who organized this meeting. It's really an honor to be here. Um, and so <clears throat> I uh, also was interested in psychedelic uh, very early in my medical school. My favorite book when I was uh, in, in medical school, which started right after high school in, in France, uh, where I did my training. So my, my favorite book was uh, The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. And for somehow, there was this shift uh, for me between my interest for this field of work and my medical school. I never heard about psychedelics in a way that was um, constructive or exploratory or curious about their effect and, and how they had been used in uh, for millennials by um, indigenous cultures and how they might have a therapeutic value. It was all um, like produce of abuse uh, that could not, that led to the emergency room and that we had to know about the, the side effects, you know, and how to deal with them in the, in the, in the emergency room. And so um, I had the safety, I was very interested in psychiatry, and during my psychiatry rotations, I uh, actually really did not recognize myself, you know, in the way psychiatry was uh, practiced, in very uh, reductionist way uh, of uh, human suffering. And uh, I ended up um, choosing to orient my, my career in, uh, towards uh, oncology and hematology, and then palliative care. And um, for the same reason that Emma presented this article of 2012 uh, in the New York Times, you know, I suddenly realized that there was this whole field of uh, a potential medical use of psychedelic acid therapy that really um, uh, excited me to, to pursue further. And, um, and so the, the, the reason of that trajectory, you know, is um, as a hematologist, I, um, the, the perspective of illness uh, of medical illness is that it's, it's an enemy that we need to fight. And um, that suffering is also the enemy that we need to uh, alleviate. And that death is a failure, you know, for uh, the, the clinician, the physician. And so um, you can see how there is a whole range of the human experience that is not recognized here, you know, in uh, how people experience illness and death and dying. And, but that's, um, that, that's never addressed or very rarely addressed uh, in, in the medical field, you know, or less so now. But so palliative care developed over the, over the, the past few decades um, as a way to balance that and to address uh, the different needs, clinical, uh, physical needs, and the emotional needs, the social needs, and the spiritual needs of people who uh, face serious illness and their families, because all this happens in community. And, um, and so I was really interested to learn more about how to practice this medicine. And, but still, when it comes to um, uh, the psycho-existential experience of serious illness, I think we very uh, often fell short of um, how we can help people really improve. And there is so much that we can do, you know, to address suffering, uh, especially when we have no longer control over the disease progression. But, um, but still, there is like, what can we do first? And when I, when I became interested in psychedelic acid therapy in France, there was a whole debate around terminal sedation. And uh, the, the law was changing around terminal sedation. And we were um, allowing uh, people to, uh, to, to, to be really, um, to be lowered consciousness. Uh, for existential distress, really, you know, for refractory, what we call refractory existential distress. And so what is refractory existential distress in medicine, you know, and how do we even define existential distress and how do we address ex the, the existential experience of people? And so all these questions, I think, resonated a lot with the, the work that was 
uh, emerging through psychedelic assisted therapy and really uh, got me excited to, to, to further my training and my research uh, on this topic. And so I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, complete a two-year research fellowship at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, uh, learning how to conduct research on psychosocial oncology and palliative care. And, um, and I also completed the, the, the certificate program in, th in psychedelic therapies and uh, research at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, and really, so during my research fellow fellowship, so that this is where I find fascinating this idea of interdisciplinary work around that. But really the questions that we addressed were um, bringing stakeholders that uh, in serious illness care, you know, so the, 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 the clinicians, the, the oncologists, the psycho-oncologists, psychiatrists, psycho, um, the social workers, the chaplains, and the, the, the researchers on spiritual research, and to um, have them consider the question of the potential role of psychedelic assisted therapies in patients with serious illness, and how do we do that? And so um, from that, we define the research priorities for this field, and how do we, you know, what are the, the, the essential questions that we research needs to address? And so some of them are very practical, you know, so what are the patients uh, who um, will benefit from psychedelic assisted therapy, and when during their disease trajectories, um, how, according to which therapeutic modalities, you know, which drug, which psychotherapy, and how many preparation and integration sessions, and who needs to be the clinicians, who, so really, like, um, very practical questions around how we implement that, and then measuring the effect. How do we measure the effect? And we have all these psychiatric categories on depression, anxiety, uh, the, the trauma, etc. But there is something around distress that is not necessarily captured by that, and that many people experience uh, in serious illness. Uh, so how do we refine our measurement uh, tools to, to assess the, the efficacy? And then there's all the questions of implementation and access and equitability, you know, like um, how do we make it such that those who might benefit from this treatment can actually access it? Um, so about two years ago, we've been able to start uh, our first uh, clinical trial that actually has been enrolling over the past year. Um, and so these, um, I believe, are the first patients at Harvard, you know, like uh, who received psychedelic assisted therapy since the, the 60s. And uh, we've been amazed by how, um, how much work it is to integrate um, psychedelic assisted therapy among existing um, uh, structures of, of healthcare, you know, of serious illness care. And, but how important it is, you know, like, so um, there we, work with, so the, the, this first study is a study of psilocybin assisted therapy uh, in patients who receive hospice care. And we address demoralization, which is a syndrome of existential distress, um, where people are a struggle with meaning and purpose and with coping. Um, and so it's different from depression. Uh, and it's more about the existential nature of their suffering. Um, so people who um, qualify for, so there is a whole screening process, and then the people who qualify for the study, um, we, there is a lot of communication with their hospice team, and then they go through the psilocybin assisted therapy, and then there is a handoff to the hospice team. And this, I think the way we approach that is how important it is to build this knowledge and this, uh, this practice on existing uh, structures of healthcare. Um, and that's what makes the, the, the meaning and the, the, the therapeutic value you know, sustainable and also um, coherent with like a, a global approach of care. Um, so I just wanna tell you about um, a couple of patients maybe that we've treated. Uh, the first patient that enrolled the study was this 60-year-old uh, man with a metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. And um, this man was really able to feel alive again uh, after the psilocybin assisted therapy through his, like, the, a renewed ability to feel connected to himself, to others, to nature, and to music. 
who was a gardener, who was a musician, and who um, uh, loved hanging around with his friends. And the disease had made him unable to access these coping mechanisms, you know. And through his journey, he was able to um, revisit his relationship with what's meaningful for him and really to find new ways of implementing that in his life. And he lived like several months with, um, uh, you know, a lot of meaningful relationship with his family and the, the hospice team. And that really helped me have a, uh, help, help him have a peaceful death. Um, we treated this 47 year old woman uh, who, has, uh, who had teenage children and who was re receiving hospice care for uh, a pulmonary disease. And so she qualified for the study, uh, meeting the criteria for demoralization. Uh, and her narrative was, um, I won the shitty lot lottery. You know, I, I have this disease and I feel alone and isolated with it. I think cut from my family, cut from my role as a mother, and I'm going to die uh, alone and leave everybody behind. Um, and after the psychedelic acid therapy, she uh, actually no longer qualified for demoralization on the scale we, we use, um, which translated by being really at peace with herself and present for her family. And she had um, uh, this really beautiful, profound experience of connecting with the primordial river uh, during her experience and also did a lot of grief work and find herself much more um, accessible and available for uh, her family uh, as a mom and was able to, um, to provide, actually, to continue really relate with her identity. Um, so bringing back to uh, a sense of wholeness despite the disease and despite um, the, the, yeah, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the loss of function. Um, so I know I'm at time, so I'm going to stop here. Um, we, uh, there is, as I said, there is a lot um, of research questions to be addressed. We, um, are, we have studies coming up with, for, to address uh, opioid refractory pain uh, with psilocybin. We work um, on uh, studies of MDMA-assisted therapies in patients and family caregivers. Um, we are very interested in um, implementing group and peer support, you know, to for uh, to increase accessibility and um, and scalability, uh, and how we we have a lot, we learn a lot about how to um, involve care, care family caregivers uh, in uh, in patients' care, uh, and something that we are really interested in as well is the use of music uh, in psychedelic acid therapy. Uh, we've been working with a, a music therapist, guided imagery and music therapy, and have um, really uh, learned uh, a lot about how to um, use music as a therapist in the room. Um, right, so thank you very much. I'll just, just stop here. Thank you so much to Dr. Busan for that truly moving and I think critical work. And I, as you can see, any one of these speakers could take an entire conference, so we appreciate them. Um, being here and sharing a little snippet, and we hope that the reception afterwards and the Q&A will allow more time to discuss the sort of nuances of all of this. Next up, I'm inviting Grant Jones to the stage. Um, Grant is a musician and researcher currently enrolled in the clinical psychology PhD program at Harvard University. His research and life work centers around developing and, in, and implementing contemplative and liberatory tools for diverse populations. Doctor already or, or no. soon to be? Soon to be, doctor. Um. Hello, folks. It's really sweet to be with you all this morning. Um, yeah, um, again, my name is Grant Jones, and I'm a fifth year clinical psychology PhD here at Harvard. And I wanted to take the next eight minutes to tell you all a little bit about my research. So, um, like was just mentioned, my research centers around contemplative um, tools, particularly for supporting flourishing and well-being in diverse populations with a particular focus on black American wellness. And in graduate school, my research is focused on two domains that I um, fully intend to continue forward throughout my life and career. Um, the first domain has centered around psychedelics, um, as is uh, probably unsurprising. And the second um, has focused around um, meditation and music. So I look forward to telling you about both domains um, right now. 
So the first domain um, uh, around psychedelics is a question that I came to graduate school and just sat with for a couple years because I think the question for me was like, how am I actually going to research this for real as a graduate student who can't actually administer psychedelic treatments, who um, with all the barriers and all the hurdles um, around um, what it will actually take to do this research. And so I sat with the question, I sat with the question, I sat with the question, um, you know, tried a few things. Um, bounced a few things off um, my advisor, um, and was just, yeah, just spun my wheels for a little bit, for sure. Um, but what emerged for me as a, as a viable pathway um, was actually using um, large epidemiological data sets to look at the associations that psychedelics share with mental health outcomes. Um, as some of you may be familiar with, there um, are data sets that, um, like the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, that collect um, data on thousands of uh, Americans each year, and also collect um, data on thousands of different variables related to substance use and health. And actually some foundational research within psychedelics um, prior to my enrollment in graduate school had looked at um, associations within these data sets to start to lay preliminary um, groundwork for the associations between how psychedelics might be linked um, in protective manners with some of these variables. So um, carrying up the mantle of that research, um, I, de I developed um, an analytical framework based on some of the research that had um, been developed before. And what I did was I systematically um, looked at various um, mental health outcomes and um, uh, addiction variables within this data set, and a very clear pattern emerged across a number of different studies, um, which was that if you, um, you know, control for the same exact set of demographic variables, same exact set of substance use variables, you see a very consistent pattern where classic psychedelics and also um, synthetic um, psychedelics like MDMA, um, you know, um, and pathogen, um, as we all have been. Uh, have talked about uh, here <laughs> at the very least, um, you see this very consistent pattern whereby these substances are conferring lowered odds um, of um, outcomes that we've discussed, such as depression, um, psychological distress, and also some novel ones, cocaine use disorder um, is one domain I've looked at. Um, also have looked at um, the associations between um, MDMA uh, use and um, various markers of social impairment showing that even within a large population-based data set with hundreds of thousands of people, you're actually seeing very similar patterns that we know intuitively that MDMA is conferring, MDMA specifically and uniquely is conferring lowered odds um, of these data set, um, of, the, of this variable in a way that is um, consistent with um, what we know clinically. And again, although my research is very clearly not causal, and I always like to say that very clearly as a limitation, what excites me about this research, particularly in being able to engage it now and being a steward of it now, is that um, as psychedelic research um, paradigms uh, develop further, and as um, more funding continues to, um, to uh, flow into the space and it becomes a bit easier to conduct clinical research around these substances, this foundational um, correlational research will be there as the springboard for um, more direct causal inquiries. Um, so that's part one. Part two um, is um, really now where um, I get particularly excited um, because this is around how psychedelic use um, exists within communities of color. And so um, it might be news to some of you, but um, probably unsurprising to many that um, psychedelic research has thus far been extremely homogenous. There's very, very few papers published about what psychedelic use looks like in communities of color, let alone psychedelic use as it impacts the mental health um, and behavioral outcomes within um, diverse populations. So what I've done within graduate school um, is I've taken some of the correlational data that I've looked at, um, some of the associations that I just previously named, and have started to look at how uh, race and ethnicity might moderate some of these associations, and also using um, uh, using um, race and ethnicity um, as a variable by which I stratify um, the aso these associations. Look specifically at how these associations might vary by different races and ethnicities. And what I've found now across a few different um, a few different um, of these associations is not only does race and ethnicity moderate these associations, but when you actually stratify some of these associations by race and ethnicity, you're actually seeing um, many fewer, many weaker associations between psychedelic use um, and lowered odds of um, some of the deleterious outcomes that I've named, and actually all of, much of the effects that I've actually um, documented in some of the associational studies that I uh, mentioned previously has been driven by the white participants within the study. Um, and I think, again, while those, this is not a causal, I cannot make any causal claims, I think why at least it raises important questions is because if you look at, again, the clinical research that's been done in this space and you realize the extreme limitations to external validity, it brings up natural questions of what does it actually mean to bring these uh, substances into communities of color if even at the cor correlational level you're seeing 
radically different um, associations um, already there. Um, and again, probably unsurprising to many of you, there are already issues coming up around harm and implementation within clinical research. Um, and so for me, it's uh, these questions are important to ask now rather than um, down the line once structures have been built that systematically harm people in uh, very familiar ways um, that, uh, that we, um, many of us are probably uh, acquainted with, or at least have heard of at the very least, I hope. Um, so yeah, that's part two. Part three is now around my music and um, meditation research, which is um, particularly exciting for me because right now I'm in the middle of like an extreme grant uh, writing marathon around it. So um, send me uh, blessings for that. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, my dissertation um, and the, really the beating heart of a lot of my graduate work um, has centered around um, developing a, um, a music-based mindfulness intervention that combines originally composed black American music that I made um, with contributions from um, a few uh, black, uh, world-renowned black collaborators that I'm blessed to uh, be able to work with, such as Lama Rod Owens, who is a world-renowned meditation teacher and LA Times bestselling author, and also um, Terry Edmonds, who is the former chief speechwriter for President Bill Clinton. And they, um, Lama Rod Owens contributed guided meditations to the intervention, and Terry committed it uh, um, contributed contemplative poetry. And um, what I have done is um, uh, create um, a, this contemplative intervention um, that's uh, meant to reduce race-based anxiety in the black community and also inspire uh, mindfulness and self-compassion. So what I've done is across two pilot studies um, that utilize the multiple baseline design, which um, just for a brief overview, just entails taking repeated measures of one's outcomes of interest across two different phases, a non-intervention phase where you're not playing any music or any of the intervention, then an intervention phase in which you are actually administering the intervention. Um, and then seeing just in a very simple way, how, does, how do people change across these outcomes when you administer the intervention versus not? Um, and it's very small end study, so I've only uh, run it within 13 people generally. But what I have seen um, across the, this, um, this preliminary um, inquiry is, um, uh, is that my hypotheses have been supported at this stage, which is exciting. Um, so um, so um, you do see significant reductions in race-based uh, anxiety and also increases in mindfulness and self-compassion. And I think for me, again, even though it's a small end study, I think what excites me most is around feasibility and acceptability. So. Um, Within participants, the average score of recommending the intervention thus far and uh, has been 94 out of 100, which is really exciting. So people are really um, into at least exploring this as a, uh, as a form of uh, healing for themselves. And so what I hope to do now, like I said, is acquire greater resources to further build this intervention and test it um, for persisting clinical outcomes and eventually combine it with psychedelic therapies for communities of color. Thank you for receiving my talk. Thank you so much, soon to be Dr. Jones. Many blessings on that journey. Um, phenomenally interesting work, and I should note that um, Lama Rod Owens is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School, um, is doing phenomenal. I'm so excited to hear you're collaborating with him. Um, an amazing essay on his experiences of healing trauma using ayahuasca with his plant medicine work um, in Black and Buddhist, which is a, a phenomenal text I would recommend to folks, and just cannot wait to hear more about, about your work, Grant. So next up, we have Dr. Fernando S.B. Forsen who is an attending psychiatrist at the inpatient unit of Massachusetts General Hospital and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He also has a PhD on the state of mental health in the Middle Ages. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Espy Forsen. There you are. Well, it's amazing to be here. When I came this morning, I was like, oh my god. Harvard Divinity School, this is amazing. I mean, who, I'm from South Spain and I'm still integrating this experience of being a speaker at Harvard. And yeah, I really appreciate being here and being invited. So thank you all for attending this. Um, well, I want to thank Jeff and Paul as well for organizing this. I want to thank Franklin as well, who has been a little bit of my guardian angel at the MGH. And he's the one who has been putting me in all these conferences and helping me. So. Thank you all. So I'm talking about ketamine. I had some slides, but when I saw the vibe today, I told them, man, you know, remove the slides. Let's just, <laughs> let's just talk here, because we're all talking and sharing feelings. Huh? Like many of us um, who are here, uh, my interest in psychedelics started with a personal experience with psychedelics. <laughs> and then I was in training, and I was thinking, oh my god, if everybody tried this, <laughs> there wouldn't be war. <laughs> There wouldn't be conflicts. We all would love each other. And I think psychedelics are really helpful for that. You know, it really. <laughs> so 
it, it's a little bit like um like cognitively you see it like yeah we are all part of the same blah 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 and it's, we are all stardust but there you feel it you're like man now i feel it emotionally you know so it's so amazing and ever since when i meet other people who are psychedelic experience we are like yeah yeah we know we don't have to talk about the real estate market we can talk about other things that are more important you know <laughs> so this is part of the thing and now as i'm talking about ketamine <laughs> which is the talk today uh actually i must say that this comes very timely because i'm doing my ketamine psychedelic psychotherapy training right now at the boston psychedelic research group and yesterday i had my 300 milligrams myself of lozenges of ketamine and I was thinking, when I was there, very far away, I was thinking, how can I talk about ketamine? You know, how can I talk about what I'm experiencing right now in a way that it makes sense verbally? Because it's, it's, it's very non-verbal, that experience, and it's so powerful. And I will talk about my ketamine experience, but I don't want to miss out the topic, which is ketamine in the inpatient psychiatry unit. So... I work as a psychiatrist in an inpatient psychiatry unit, and I work with psychiatry residents and med students every day, which is a gift because I get like the smarter people in the world, I think, you know, you guys are so smart. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, how can I teach these people? But it's very amazing. And what we see, many of our patients are, they have active psychosis, active mania, or suicidal radiation. And the most effective treatments that we have in psychiatry for suicide alleviation was psychotherapy or electroconvulsive therapy. But ketamine came out as a new treatment that not from the psychedelic world, from psychiatrists at NIH thinking, wow, this really helps suicide alleviation. So we're thinking, why I cannot give ketamine to my patients with suicide alleviation? Because this is something that a problem that we have at inpatient psychiatry units. And Eventually, with some effort, we've been able to make some exceptions, and I'm talking about MGH. Most, I work in a med psych unit. In most units in psychiatry nowadays, despite being in a hospital, we don't have IVs. So we couldn't do ketamine IV because we don't have IVs. And we cannot do IMs because sometimes the staff don't feel comfortable doing an IM. I mean, they feel very comfortable doing the Haldo IM, but they don't feel comfortable with the ketamine IM because they've never done it. So it's really a limitation that we have in inpatient psychiatry unit. So when I was working at the inpatient psychiatry unit, <clears throat> we had patients, I don't know, we had a patient that was not getting better on ECT. And she had like severe trauma from 9-11 because she was one of the person who sold the tickets uh, to the terrorists twice. And she was like, what's going on? And then she felt very guilty that, you know, for the Boston flight. And we brought the case now, it's under review now. Well, it's about to, to you know, second, second review the, the case report. But after that case, I was like, we need to make an exception for this patient. And we have another patient as well that was not getting better with anything. I was like, we need to make an exception. Like two patients really changed how we are sifting, uh, how my unit and my department is thinking about this. Like these two patients were extremely suicidal. One of them was very suicidal with gunshot, you know, attempts to, to shoot himself. Another one was a survivor of 9-11 who was extremely suicidal. And I was saying myself, I'm standing on this one. I'm not discharging these patients. So if, if the, the unit director or somebody else wants to discharge the patient, I'm not discharging them. And after 12 sessions of ECD, one patient in the end, they approved. They approved ketamine. So I was able to send the patient to the ketamine clinic that we have. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go do psychedelic integration therapy here. So we started doing psychedelic integration therapy. And it really helped the patients. And some of the patients, they said, the ketamine helped me, but the therapy really helped me. And this is another problem that we face in inpatient psychiatry. So for some reason, ketamine, because it came from pharmacology or NIH, they don't consider that a psychedelic. So it's considered now a neuromodulation. So they put ketamine under the neuromodulation department together with electroconvulsive therapy and, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. And when I try to say, hey, I want to do psychedelic psychotherapy, they're like, no, you don't want to do that. We took ketamine already. You cannot take it. And this is how things work, you know? So now we are hoping that maybe with MDMA, they don't want to take it, you know, and they allow us to take it, you know, because this is where we are. So I'm doing ketamine integration psychotherapy with patients that we can refer to the ketamine clinic. No, oh, I have like uh, four minutes here, but that's fine. I'll finish in two minutes. So I'm doing this, and then I'm trying to figure out 
what okay so we have seven cases now we're trying to publish a case series we're doing a ketamine study as well with CAMS, which is a complex assessment and management of suicide therapy and we struggle also with which therapy might work for these people so we have mini center psychotherapy makes sense for suicidal because mini center psychotherapy like Viktor frankel helps it's an existentialist so we have existential therapy we have dynamic therapy i found myself reading jung again i found myself reading dream interpretation and doing dream uh, because in ketamine you have like dreams as well and, and with these patients all these therapies resonate and this is something i'm trying to understand and that's part of the reason i'm doing my ketamine training right now so yes to end because i have only a couple more minutes uh ketamine neuromodulation versus ketamine uh, psychedelic psychotherapy, this is the conflict we're dealing with now. Um, I think ketamine without psychotherapy is potentially harmful to patients because many of the patients when I was going to ketamine clinic, they were freaking out. They were like, oh my God, because they are told these are just side effects that they get and this is potentially harmful. So we had to really think about this as a community. And then uh, I just want to talk about my experience. Actually yesterday, I was like, I'm talking about ketamine all the time, ketamine in this model, but yesterday I took the ketamine and me as a ketamine researcher, as a ketamine psychiatrist, I experienced ketamine. I took 300, I had my sitter there, and I was holding the hand of my sitter, and I was going really, really far. I mean, I was, and at some point I was so far that I forgot if I was on ketamine or MDMA or LSD or psilocybin, all of them looked the same to me, you know? And I started thinking of my friends that I love so much that I was in Mexico with recently, and I was thinking about them. And I was thinking about my, my, my family, and I was thinking about my girlfriend, and I was thinking how much I love everybody. I was thinking of all the 30 people that were the, with me that I love so much, and I felt this universal love. And then when they were waking me up, they had to wake me up, but they couldn't. And they were like, I was like, and I was like, I cannot come back. And I grabbed the seat that I went even farther away. But eventually when they, were, when they managed to wake me up, uh, I just told that the, the first person who woke me up, who was like one of the organizers, said, man, I love you so much, you know? I love everybody. I love you guys. You know, so I think love is 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 the answer. It sounds cheesy, but love is the answer. So uh, that's all. Thank you. I have a new and very uh, intense interest in existential therapy now. Um, thank you so much, um, <laughs> Dr. Epson Florson. Um, so our final speaker for this block before we move over to Q&A is going to be Dr. Stephen Haggerty. Um, Dr. Stephen Haggerty is an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He is the director of chemical neurobiology of the Chemical Neurobiology Laboratory at the Mass General Center for Genomic Medicine, and he is scientific director of neurobiology for Mass General Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics in the Department of Psychiatry. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Haggerty. I'm so thrilled to be here today and to be connecting with you all. Uh, that was a really going to be a hard act to follow here in terms of um, inspiration. But, um, you know, this is, I think, uh, just an amazing ability for our community to come together in moments like this. And I want to take the theme today of explorations and tell you a little bit about what I think is most exciting on the frontiers of psychedelic research. Before I do so, I do have a few disclosures. I work very actively with members of the biotech and pharmaceutical industry that's very present in our Boston Cambridge environment and think they're actually really important partners in having the opportunity to deliver medicines and actually impact patient care. For me, psychedelics indeed are something that can connect our community together and has been doing so for millennia. In fact, we're all here today because of this common uh, interest. But beyond just connecting the community together, they provide really powerful tools to study the human nervous system at a variety of different levels, both spatially and temporally. Whether it be trying to understand where the receptors are for such agents such as psilocybin, as depicted here in an image using positron emission tomography to localize a receptor within the human brain, or using other modalities such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, allowing us to see changes in connectivity or brain function or also at a more molecular and cellular level, the changes in activity of different cell types that may ultimately underlie the phenomena that we're so uh, interested in. And these tools I really think are a gift and a gift for us to study the nervous system um, and think about the applications and for mental health. 25 years ago, when I was a graduate student wandering the streets here of Divinity uh, Avenue, a member of the uh, chemistry and chemical biology department, I started to become interested in the concept of brain plasticity. 
and started to think about who are the members of our community that have studied plasticity. And one of the first quotes I came across then here is from our great uh, William James, who to the young chemist in me piqued my interest because he described these as the nature of plasticity having an organic basis. And that this degree of plasticity that the brain can undergo is something that we really want to turn our attention to, to study. Now, I don't know that this is true, but William James, to me, is actually one of the first psychedelic researchers at Harvard through his experience both with mescaline and nitrous oxide. He actually didn't like mescaline from his descriptions. He liked nitrous oxide a little bit more. And perhaps it was these agents that really inspired his notion of this so-called noetic sense. And it was this reading for a chemist in me that really piqued my interest about these other areas of medicine. But I have to come back to someone who was already mentioned here today, in particular in the theme of exploration and the critical role that Harvard has played historically in this exciting field of psychedelics. Those of you that don't know the great Professor Richard Evan Schultes really should spend some time this weekend reading a little bit and discovering some of his amazing work. Many consider him to be a founding figure of the field of modern ethnobotany, the systematic study of the relationships then between plants and humans and how they've been used over time. Schultes is fascinating in a number of facets in part because he's a homegrown Bostonian, grew up in East Boston, 276 Lexington Ave, an area of Boston that's almost completely void of any plants or trees if you go to there. He was such a remarkable student, though, that his professors realized his special potential and he obtained a scholarship to come to Harvard. Working with the great Oaks Ames, who recognized, again, Schulte's talents, he began to work within the Harvard herbaria just across the street here. Schulte spent his entire life here at Harvard, besides the time that he escaped to the Amazon, as was mentioned, for over a decade. He not only was critical for the creation of the Harvard Botanical Museum, but most importantly, I think, educated and inspired a whole generation of ethnobotanists that became interested in this area of psychedelic uh, research. Now, um, it is said that Schultes um, became interested in psychedelics from reading this little book as a class assignment that he had, a book written by a German psychiatrist named Heinrich Kluver. Why this book was in the Harvard Herbaria is a question I would love a historian of science to answer for me, but it inspired and exposed Schultes to the wonders then of psychedelics. This led then to Schultes in his entire research career at Harvard to make fundamental contributions to the very nature of the phytochemicals that are the basis of the psychedelic renaissance. Not only studying the sacred cacti, peyote, and the source of mescaline, but teonotocotyl, the mushroom then that gives rise to psilocybin and other alkaloids. His PhD work then on ololiqui, morning glories, again, fundamental contributions. But Schultes really set this stage for the need for interdisciplinary collaboration, not only being inspired by a psychiatrist, but working with the great Swiss chemist, Albert Hoffman. In some of his seminal work then summarizing the nature of this phytochemistry became really inspirational to me to think about the power of using chemistry to study the nervous system. And these fundamental contributions then really capture, I think, this critical need for interdisciplinary uh, research. As was mentioned already this morning here, Schultes was not only an expert and passionate follower in the uh, field thinking about plants such as Banistrapsis campi and members of that family, that may seem distant to all of you, but if anyone has had any coffee this afternoon, you've had other members of that same family. But it's the great other discoveries of Schultes that really excite me. A plant such as Tetratus methistica, or Stelloptera, as mentioned here, we know has an unknown characteristic psychedelic activity, and we know that from, as in Schultes' own words, his own self-experiments. Schultes recognized this plant was special because unlike ayahuasca, it was consumed not as an admixture, but alone. And to this date, we still don't know what the active psychedelic agent is in there. And while there's speculation that it may be a member of the Harmine family, scientifically that remains unproven. What's so exciting is to think that this type specimen shown here in the middle of the slide actually lives and exists within the Harvard herbaria, if one can gain access to it to begin studying it. And indeed, in 2023, I think the amazing legacy of Schultes and his students and the knowledge that he created provides an incredible roadmap. 
It was this quote that I have to admit inspired me to pursue a career leading to my activities at Mass General Hospital. And Schultes and Albert Hoffman posed this as a question here of whether if we thoroughly understood the whole nature, the chemical composition, perhaps we would be able to have new tools for psychiatric research. This is amazing that this was work and thought done almost 50 years ago, again, providing a real exciting roadmap. The book here, Plants of the Gods, is for me, in many ways, a type of Bible that I've carried with me. I couldn't afford a first edition version of this when I was a graduate student, and it's a pleasure to read each one of these because they're really not only works of science, they're works of art. It was with great pleasure then, as was mentioned by Dr. King, that we had the opportunity to launch in 2021 the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics. This mission to really fundamentally change how we provide care, I think is again, an incredible opportunity for our community to come together and think about the impact that we can have on mental health. This image here on the right shown of Dr. Jerry Rosenbaum, the center director, and the notion here of being able to study Tiananmen and those magic mushrooms, I think would make Schultes really pleased today if he was still alive. The center then purposely combines together some leaders, not only in clinical care, but opportunities such as that led by Bruce Rosen and colleagues to use the state of the art neuroimaging techniques to finally map what circuits and cell types perhaps are affected by these uh, agents. Again, fundamental work, um, not only on the use of these agents, but really understanding then how they modulate neuroplasticity on that range of temporal and spatial uh, scales. But I want you to, for a moment, pretend with me and dream about what the future is going to look like. So please reach under your um, chair, hypothetically, and put on your future goggles for a moment. And I want to imagine that this is a member of your family that comes into the hospital, perhaps a member with treatment-resistant depression or anxiety, and a clinical and family history is collected of the individual, maybe a cognitive assessment, and a desire then to provide care to that patient is extended. Imagine aspects of modern translational research where we may neuroimage that person to understand if there's particular circuits altered in that case. Let's assume that we could readily sequence the genome of that individual to understand if they had risk factors, all of which then may help us determine what therapy to provide. But the technology that we're particularly passionate about and excited to bring into this realm is this remarkable ability to use human stem cell technology that we can collect from each of you a somatic sample, a skin sample, or perhaps blood, using Yamanaka and colleagues' remarkable techniques to reprogram that into a stem cell, allowing access to the human nervous system. This fundamental technology, again, provides an opportunity to study human neurobiology and our opportunity then to use this so-called to do an ex vivo psychedelic test, we think has the opportunity to enhance our understanding of how psychedelics work. But we're not limited to studying those just in dissociated neurons in a culture, using technologies to create these so-called mini brains, forming a little tissue-like structure, allows us now to think about the complexity of the human nervous system. In that little ball in the Petri dish here, if we were to section it, we could actually see that we have different layers of cell types corresponding to the amazing laminar structure in the human cortex. This again provides us an opportunity to, for the first time, study what psychedelics do to the human nervous system, ex vivo in the culture uh, from this. We're interested in the notion of that plasticity, whether it be changed by neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and all of those mechanisms. So the opportunity now to systematically study these plants gets us extremely excited. We're assembling a collection of plants, beginning to fractionate them to identify active compounds and test those back onto those organoids. I'll tell you though, that it isn't just the lab techniques that we're most excited about. We think about this um, notion of the resources here within the herbaria and larger herbaria across the world, incredible knowledge is still present. This experiment here done by Siri von Reich Altschul, where it took the entire Harvard herbarium, took roughly four and a half years to ask the question how many of those plants were medicinally relevant. Today, using exciting technologies and AI machine learning, we can rapidly digest knowledge and connect knowledge together, providing really, we think, exciting opportunities to revitalize the field of ethnobotany. 
And we think for those reasons, the opportunity to bring together these technologies to think about the human entheome in the broadest sense, as was mentioned, is really something worth doing here. This notion of combining together aspects of botany, genomics, and pharmacology, we think has long lasting uh, implications for this. And to give you just an example of what I mean by inspirations from other disciplines here, um, and please excuse my uh, Nahuatl language, but this um, particular Aztec rain god, Tlaloc, then, if you study the language and words associated um, with that, you'll notice that there's often the description of a plant called Tegetes lucida, or Mexican marigold. This is a plant that still has an entheogenic use, as in an example, though, that we know nothing, again, about its activities, providing, though, a really exciting direction. And in that context, we've been working on growing and expanding our access to these. Thanks to COVID, we have the opportunity to now really begin working with these, in this case, at home. This is a picture here of Tegetes lucida that I grew last summer, and a whole collection then of plants that really have remained understudied, but provide an incredible opportunity for gaining insight. And to help make this possible, we're really excited about a concept here of revitalizing an existing greenhouse that exists at Mass General Hospital. I find it sort of interesting that the location of this is right proximal to where some of the first studies on ether, an agent that of course causes a loss of consciousness, we're talking about molecules that we hope can enhance consciousness. Fundamentally though, I think what's key for the future here is to expand our opportunities for students interested in training in this field and area. This is a picture of Hannah Hilton, class of 21. To my knowledge, one of the first theses done at Harvard in half a century on the topic of the mechanisms of psychedelic agents. We're lucky that we've been able to work again with members of the pharmaceutical industry to provide support for a fellowship, which is now going to enter its second year, the so-called Atai Pioneer Fellowship. Those of you interested and um, excited about this, please reach out. Our next deadline for this is May uh, 1st. And with that, I'll end and just again, thank the amazing group of colleagues who's inspired me uh, and thank the great work, both traditional knowledge keepers and others that have helped uh, create this field. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haggerty. We are now at a point for Q&A. Um, as before, I'll invite all of the speakers from this block up to the stage. Hi, thanks so much, everybody. Um, very basic question. I'm interested in um, age of participants. You know, when we think about the sort of mental health challenges um, that young people are facing uh, and the sorts of drugs that are oftentimes administered to them. Um, that, you know, in, in many, many cases lead to, to drug abuse later in life. I'm curious if there are any studies. I imagine it's very difficult um, to get IRB approval and there are ethical and developmental questions that need to be answered. But what are the youngest participants that are being worked with? So actually, the IBS study that I mentioned, the irritable bowel syndrome study, because I'm doing it with uh, someone from the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, initially, we were thinking that we would do it with the population known as transitional age youth, which can be defined variously, but usually it's 16 to mid-20s. Um, and we were going to modify that to be 18. We were going to do 18 to 25 um, and only focus on those folks because that's really when you start solidifying maladaptive behaviors in response to both psychiatric conditions, but also medical conditions. So, you know, the idea other than her being a pediatrician was that we could focus on the sort of young population that really weren't sort of dug in. We ended up just, we're going to start at age 21 um, for various reasons. A, a number of studies have started enrolling at age 18. I'm not familiar with any studies that have been done with anybody younger than that. And a lot of studies uh, start at age 21. There are issues. I mean, I think the, the one thing that nobody really knows is, is this are, is psychedelic exposure kind of the equivalent of heavy cannabis exposure? We know that heavy cannabis exposure, um, you know, daily, repetitively during a vulnerable time when the brain is developing does predispose and, and it does lead to an increased risk of developing schizophrenia. And so, you know, the, one of the theories behind that is that if you sort of really induce a lot of stress to the brain, that that could be one of the sort of final common pathways to developing a first episode psychosis. And potentially there might be a similar risk with psychedelics. We don't know. 
Um, and we ultimately just decided that it probably would be more difficult and more ethically questionable to only focus on people in that putative risk state. But I don't think anybody knows. And in, in regards to the risk of addictive behavior, you know, the evidence is, is pretty strongly against the fact that psychedelics lead to addictions. There's a lot of studies um, and some that are going to be starting at Brigham looking at using psychedelics to actually treat various forms of addiction. Um, and, you know, I think the evidence base at this point is pretty solid that, you know, for the vast majority of people that using psychedelics is not a risk factor or like a gateway drug to, to using other things. For the ketamine study is uh, youth. So it's 16 to 24, but we couldn't get enough people. So now it's 16 to 30, but there are a lot of adult studies and this will be like a study in youth. So. Oh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for your pioneering work in this area. I think it's incredibly exciting. Um, my question is probably directed towards uh, Dr. Franklin King, but maybe more generally. And the, the question is, uh, in these pioneering studies at MGH on the use of psychedelics for depression, um, what's kind of the, the primary factors for success in terms of uh, like the person sitting with them, the environment that they're in? Do we expect to just give someone psychedelics and put them in a room with, with somebody with a notepad and hope that that's the, the experience that will be effective for them? Or uh, kind of what factors are we able to change? And I guess, do you have opinions on, on things that are like first order importance for somebody's success in one of these trials? Um, I'll answer part of that just since you've addressed it to me, but I think, you know, Yvonne and Fernando can also speak to that, but in terms of, um, you know, some of the stuff I said about how kind of alien a lot of the critical parts of psychedelic assisted therapy are, one of those is the appreciation of set and setting, or really the appreciation just of context, which we don't pay much attention to. We sort of presume that a patient going into a horrible drop ceiling with flickering, flickering fluorescent lights and an unpleasant aesthetic environment is really going to achieve the same benefit, even in psychiatry, as a really nice thoughtful, soothing environment. So I actually, I don't think set and setting is limited to psychedelics, but it is crucial. There was, you know, there were a number of studies done in the 1960s in very medical appearing environments where people had a much higher rate of sort of having an untoward reaction or feeling like while they're on psychedelics, they were the victim of medical experimentation or sort of feelings and or thoughts in that regard. So I think, yes, um, for the studies that are being done at MGH, there are specific rooms that are going to that have been basically outfitted to be nice really to essentially mimic the environment of a living room and that's really important um I, you know I, I think you know you've actually started and and have a room so maybe you could speak to that and fernando as well yeah um no i think that's really a critical question um in in our team um so we it's a small pilot study, you know, but we nevertheless have six therapists who um, uh, who conduct the therapy in dyads for each patient, and um, and among our therapy team, uh, our therapy team includes uh, people from palliative care, psychiatry, uh, music therapy, social work, chaplaincy work. So I, I say that because it's critical to um, our way of um, you know, embodying interdisciplinarity and approaching patients from multiple perspectives. But the way we conduct therapy is very simple and it's very based on um, relationship, you know, and being in relation with the person. Uh, I heard one of the speakers this morning was um, saying, uh, really talking about the, um, how in that space, uh, very restorative relationship patterns can, can happen, you know, and how the quality of uh, presence, you know, and how somebody, you know, how far can the therapies go in really um, uh, being present for the core of the patient's experience, you know? And so um, I think that's critical to uh, how far the therapeutic healing can go for the patients. And so the way we do that is really like the importance of uh, first in, in our 
study situation in a building, our understanding of the patient situations and the work that our colleagues in hospice care have already done, you know, so we, we collect a lot of information on the patient's medical and psychosocial situation ahead of time. And then we uh, engage in the relationship with the, the patients, you know, and, and during the preparation time, uh, it's really a lot about getting to know the person, getting to know the patients and the patients getting to know us and uh, establishing the therapeutic relationship, therapeutic alliance, and then um, also working on uh, intention and working on how, um, wh what is the person hoping to get from this treatment, you know, and then really being in a non-directive, very respectful of the person's inner process and, and encounter with the, with the medicine and then helping debrief. And, and so it's, you know, I, I guess, it's very agnostic of how this should be done, but it's really based on the relationship with the person. And, and the reason why we do that is because um, also we observe, and, and that's our work on the qualitative work, we were talking about ph phenomenological work, but um, we realized that psychedelic acid therapy and psilocybin in particular, or MDMA, um, are intense experiences, you know, very de demanding and intense experiencing where people experience a, a lot of tensions between surrendering to the experience and resisting to it. So it pushes towards uh, people's boundaries, you know, and, and limits. And then, the, so it places people in a place of vulnerability and dependency and, and, um, and suggestibility, you know, that we have to be very mindful in the therapy, in the therapy of how we approach that. Um, so I think the, the core of the, 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 the importance of the training, I think, is really in that aspect of the therapeutic work, you know, and how we can create the trusting relationship that allows people to go in those vulnerable places and the, really the ethical boundaries where the person is doing the work and not the therapist projecting stuff on them. I don't know if... Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, my question sort of builds on that, actually. So from a legal perspective, it's very interesting. The FDA, when it is expected to approve a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, from my knowledge, and correct me because it's your, your discipline, but it'll be the first time they're approving a drug prescribed with therapy as opposed to just a substance and um, new waters for the FDA. So what are some of the challenges, opportunities? Um, we heard therapy is a really good thing, but yeah, just in terms especially of bringing it to scale. Yeah. I mean, to your point, there is no pre-existing box in how we develop a combined drug and psychotherapy, you know, approach, you know, there is no, uh, even for the FDA or IRB uh, reviews, you know, like it's um, hard to convey the fact that both are a combined, a single entity, you know, and like it's, it, the one doesn't work without the other or is not safe or, or effective, you know, without the other. Um, and so we have to reinvent the, the frame, you know, within which we, you know, even we regulate around that and think about it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's huge, huge issues that we didn't even get into on, in terms of scalability, which is, you know, a word that I've kind of distaste for, cause that's, you know, like. CEOs figuring out scalability, how we're going to make money, but you know, how is this going to actually be accessible and who's it going to be accessible for are huge questions. So, you know, the, the therapies themselves and the protocols are hugely time consuming. I mean, the psychedelic sessions themselves just alone are you know, usually eight hours of therapy with two therapists present in most of the protocols. Plus you have, you know, a certain number of sessions of therapy with usually both therapists before and after. Right. So you're talking about a lot of upfront time. The people that are really, you know, pushing this in, in pro psychedelic assisted therapy, you know, seem to believe that, you know, the upfront cost is worth it if it actually reduces, you know, medical contact and expenditure later on. And there's some evidence to suggest that that's the case. But even so, I mean, most medical treatments that are expensive end up sorting to people who have really good insurance or just people who have a lot of money. And I think, you know, there's a very realistic risk that that's exactly what it's going to look like, especially in the early days. Um, you know, you'll have to have like not responded to a million other treatments. You'll have to have good insurance. Um, and I think that is a real issue that people need to be thinking about. 
one other thing is sort of the question of who is best suited to deliver psychedelic assisted therapy. And the irony is when you apply for an investigational new drug permit from the FDA to do these studies, they feel much more assured if the people who are in the room are either MDs or PhD psychologists, usually at an academic medical center. Um, usually PhD psychologists, academic medical centers are doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is pretty far from the type of therapy used in psychedelic assisted therapy. So it's sort of, you know, ironic that I think that that's kind of the folks that are probably most trained in being prescriptive rather than open, which is what we want in psychedelic assisted therapy are the people that are, you know, considered by the government, at least uh, best suited to deliver this. But in reality, probably people that are more versed in kind of psychodynamic therapy or other forms of non-traditional therapy, or even things outside of, you know, the mental health world altogether, like chaplains and pastoral care counselors who are well-versed at sitting with people in distress and walking beside them rather than sort of imposing their viewpoint on them um, might actually be better suited. There's no data. Nobody's looked at this as far as I know, but that's another kind of question. Who should be doing this? I'd like to add something. Yeah. This is like a it's like a, a big issue uh, for billing as well. We're trying to do a ketamine clinic. And you can build one hour uh, of a medical visit or one hour of therapy for people who are therapists. But if you're going to do the ketamine, it's going to be three hours. The insurance may cover the first hour, but the other two hours, you have to pay out of pocket. So if people are billing 200 an hour, you have to pay 400 out of pocket. If you're talking about psilocybin, when it comes out, you're talking about, I don't know, 2,000 or whatever, you know, people bill. And for inpatient uh, unit, uh, we have the chaplain and everybody. And it's just a normal, I just make it as a normal visit as a psychedelic integration therapy with the regular visit. So it's not extra cost uh, to the patient. But that's something you can do only in inpatient. In outpatient, you have to be the medical visit, the psychotherapy visit. Um, maybe you can combine those two, depending if you're is an MD, the person who prescribed the ketamine, otherwise it will be two visits. You can do a medical clearance visit. Sometimes some doctors are comfortable doing that, like half an hour for $200, and they take insurance. But uh, then for the psychotherapy, the first hour you can build, but the other two hours they had to pay out of pocket. So it's, uh, it's how it is. That's the state. Hopefully insurance will cover. They are trying to do that with, I think MAPS is trying to do a model for M uh, MDMA saying, hey, $24,000 is the whole treatment, but it will save admissions. I have my patient who the insurance wouldn't cover outpatient ketamine and it will cover inpatient ketamine. So in outpatient ketamine, she relapsed and they still didn't want to cover. So she got readmitted to McLean for two months, which is like, I don't know, like $300,000 admission. And they refuse to still cover outpatient. So because they cannot see that, they don't have a model. So if you can convince insurance that they're going to save two months of admission after that, they will start covering more because they do that. A transplant, for example, is $90,000. You know, so uh, it's not much more expensive actually than regular medical care. So, yeah. So um, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here and listening to the quality of your presentations. I mean, it, it's really a psychedelic experience for me. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, more than 40 years ago, I created an MDMA laboratory to help Alexander Shulgin. And in um, 1984, I brought MDMA to the Harvard Medical School and turned on some of the professors here, including Lester Grinspoon, who said that it was the most valuable drug in psychiatry. So now here we are, 40 something years later, and you guys are doing great work. And I'm so excited to meet and speak with all of you. But my question is, why have these incredible gifts been squandered? Why has it been four decades that we're just now seeing like permission? Like if it's permission, so here are these drugs that supposedly make us more creative, more inner oriented, more courageous. Why have we submitted to such a foul and corrupt medical pharmaceutical situation with the FDA and the DEA, why are we just now, we're actually not overcoming the corrupt system. We've somehow found a way to maybe align ourselves with it. Mm -hmm. And then what sort of sacrifices have we made to be in this position? I'm so, I'm so interested in the phenomenology and the chemistry of these states, but 
In the last decade or so, my interests have become political and sociological. And what's the deeper layer for this, um, the paucity of research and why is it just getting going now? But thank you. I mean, I, I, those are all amazing points. I would love to talk to you after this. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I, I'm sure we all have kind of similar viewpoints on this, but I think one of the things is that we are in the midst of all of these crises, like across the board. And I think there is kind of a, a desperation for something totally different that is breaking down a lot of barriers to resistance that had been there before. I, I think, you know, I was talking with someone uh, during lunch about this. What's really interesting to me about psychedelics is that now that they're kind of back in vogue, people are willing to admit prior psychedelic experience and yet not necessarily still are they willing to admit some of kind of the deeper stuff that psychedelics work through, you know, things like like love and cosmic unity and and and, you know, all these things that people repetitively come out with psychedelic insights and that those are the things I think that actually are much more threatening to our system and the way it works than than the fact that the drug is illegal or that these are these are drug experiences. So I I think it's that. I think it's, you know, we are not a culture that is really open to being open. And, you know, we got a lot of work to do. Um, but certainly I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. What are the sort of sacrifices that you have to make um, in research just to do a study that feels kind of like is, you know, is Mass General down by Charles MGH, like the best place to be giving people psilocybin, even if we design the room right. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think there's an easy answer for that. I'm sure everybody has it. I would love to speak to this. Um, first of all, I love your question so deeply. It's such a special question. Yeah, truly. And for me, in some ways, it's like been the primary motivated question around what drive, not only what drives me in this work, but how do I do this work in a way that simultaneously allows the phenomenological experiences that these substances give rise to? How does it allow the heart of contemplative practice, which for me is also a beating heart of what it means to integrate psychedelic therapies into experience? What does it mean for me to bring that work into myself simultaneously so that I get to actually, alongside you know, navigating the structures that we all do in some way, shape or form, really receive benefit, the, be the benefit um, of what I get, like Franklin mentioned, these substances really can put you onto, can wake you up to. Um, and I think for me, it's, um, you know, we all have our answer. I think, I don't think that there's one answer, but I, I think what's inspiring about, about being here today is that um, in naming this question, it's also a naming of the need not only to um, implement these substances within current systems, but also actively be challenging along the way. What are we actually doing when we bring these substances into these systems? What are we sacrificing? Not only what are we sacrificing, but in sacrificing certain elements of this experience, are we actually using them to reify the very systems that we ostensibly are trying to disrupt, but not really, you know what I mean? So like, that's that really for me is the 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 thing. It's like, if we're actually gonna use this to supercharge the same things that we've already been doing, which I think that again, in the exploration around psychedelics, um, something that hasn't been talked about is the way that they, I, in my experience, I really see them as, as really powerful supercharges for harm, actually. They powerful supercharges for gaslighting, powerful supercharges for so many of the ways of imposing realities that have, um, that we've, again, have our naming, have named, um, that, that we actually need to be using these things to disrupt. So if we're, if we're not doing this work along the same, uh, if we're not using this work um, to actually be investigating, be contemplating at the same time that we're actually implementing, I think it's, it's such a huge disservice. So um, that for me is why, like, I, um, I don't know, the, the music work that I named, frankly, is just like, I just really love making music. It's healing for me. I like it, that it like keeps me very connected to, to this. And I think we, again, I think we all have our own answer, but I, I just urge us to keep asking the question because love the question. It's the question for me. So thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Hi. my name is- so I, just, I just wanted to uh, echo with what my colleagues say, but also say that um, I learn a lot from our medical model in how to implement uh, psychedelic acid therapies, especially in patients with serious illness, 
So I work with psychiatrists who know much more than me on potential drug-drug interactions, you know, and our patients receive a lot of drug because they're very sick, you know, and like um, having an in-depth understanding of the potential, you know, like our pharmacist is involved for each patient and we really reflect on potential complications, you know, the risk that people take, you know, in engaging in psychedelic acid therapies. Um, our patient, two of our patients, um, because of their lung condition, you know, had were um, constantly on five liters of oxygen, you know, like, and I haven't seen anywhere published uh, clinical case of people undergoing like a psychedelic ST experience with oxygen, you know, requirements. So the questions that we were asking ourselves were, um, you know, will maybe the emotional intensity of their experience, you know, like make them decompensate on the respiratory function, you know? And so having like this very rigorous and scientific and medical approach also was really helpful in us uh, finding a way to, to for, for these people to have a safe access, you know, to that or to anticipate potential complications. So I just, maybe it's a way to balance, you know, like the fact that I think I don't want to demonize too much our medical model or uh, knowledge, you know, I think they can be really helpful also to learn how to integrate these into our society and, and, and models. Hello, hi, my name is Diana Munn. Um, I'm afraid that I'm going to have a couple of comments. I don't have a specific question. Um, I am Mazatec from uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Some of you may be familiar with the use of uh, psilocybin mushrooms in this region. Um, and this is one of the area that areas um, or, or communities that safeguarded the use of psilocybin mushrooms for we know at least 500 years. So there is a striking lack of information about how indigenous doctors and specifically Mazatec doctors, um, and I call them doctors on purpose, right? Because they are doctors. Um, it, there's a lack of information here, and I'm sure uh, there are opportunities to bring in their expertise, their uh, knowledge about um, guidelines, rules uh, before taking psilocybin, the settings, the timing, the schedules, the diet, pre and post ingestion, the role of poetry, song, uh, the role of language, um, the avoidance of certain things like sexual activity before and after sessions, um, the role of touch, the post-session debriefs, the use of water, tobacco, candles, cleansings, and the fact that this healing has been provided at no cost, right? So that's just one comment. There's an opportunity there, and maybe there's some barriers to get to that knowledge, but the knowledge is there. Um, and then the other uh, comment is that while in the United States and other countries, there is a movement to learn how to use these uh, medicines in a community like the Massachusetts community, we are going in an opposite direction. So there is uh, a tendency to prefer Western medicine than to have mushrooms for healing. And so there is also an opportunity for cross-cultural sharing, the use of psilocybin um, for those experienced or close to death. I don't believe that in our culture, we would ever take them for that, but there's an opportunity there. Um, and there was someone who asked about adolescence, right, and use. So um, this is not something my mom would have allowed me to do 30 years ago, but I started uh, taking psilocybin when I was about 12. And children are commonly, or eight and above, are commonly part of this communal ritual experience. And to this day, my family does not allow me to take psilocybin if it's not the mushroom, if it's not in my community, if it's not in a ritual setting with very specific guidelines. So thank you for listening. There's a lot to learn, but I am so deeply appreciative of the work that you're doing and I'm learning so much and I can't wait to go back to my community and tell them about what's happening. They know what's happening, but I don't think that there's clarity on, on, on this, these multiple directions and what our community should be doing. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the comments and all of the questions. Um, I, again, have the inenviable job of having to cut conversation short, um, but hopefully for good purpose. So we are now gonna go into a short coffee break um, and bio break until quarter of, and then we're gonna come back for three more speakers um, from the university and then move into our keynote panel, which um, to the gentleman's question about regulation will be specifically focused on regulation and law in psychedelic studies. And that panel will begin at 3.30, but um, please come back here at quarter of three for our um, next three university speakers. See you soon. Thanks. Sponsors, the Harvard Psychedelics Project at HDS, the Center for the Study of World Religions at HDS, and Harvard Divinity School. Copyright 2023, President and Fellows of Harvard College. <laughs>